Welcome to another episode of The Shred Show. Today I have got a very exciting guest. We're going to have different aspects in terms of um, success, mindset, and what it takes to be a high achiever with Mr. James Blackwell. So James is an entrepreneur who's come over from the UK to Dubai, absolutely crushing it, and has a cool story to tell in terms of where he's come from and where he's looking to go. So thank you very much for your time today, James. Really excited to have a conversation with you. Yeah, thank you for having me, Charlie. So to give a bit of a background for you, obviously I, I know where you, you come from. Like you originally come from a recruitment background in the UK and I think that's uh, a background a lot of people probably listen to this into that sort of like nine to five job mentality. Mm. And then you went from recruitment and set up your own recruitment agency of now come over to Dubai, set up another online business and start to try and conquer the world. What would you say is the big pivotal thing that shifted in your mind where you're like, fuck this, I want to be out of the system and do my own thing yeah i think originally when i started my business it was uh for freedom so the only way you can get freedom is first firstly sorting out financial freedom so make sure you make enough money where you can pick and choose when you want to work where you want to work and and travel the world so i think when i started my recruitment agency it was always with a goal to create multiple millions and have freedom but a lot of people get into a business and end up getting chained to it because they've got employees they've got a lot of pressure they have to work 60 70 hours a week but for me i always went into the business with the mindset of building out systems and delegating so I was sort of free from the day-to-day -day stuff as as quick as humanly possible so that's the reason why I guess started my recruitment agency was I had big goals I think everyone did when the when the first started out it was always to be like worth 100 million pounds and really take on the world and then over time you realize like there's probably more pillars to life than just the wealth part once you get the wealth part sorted down it's health wealth love happiness so you want to have most of the pillars like nailed down so like I first tackled you've got to get the money right first like Naval Ravikant uh, one of my favorite uh, mentors it's a very good book for people to read and he talks around like if you really want happiness like you can't be happy without money like you, you've got to get the money right a lot of people say money doesn't make you happy but most of those people don't have money so you've got to get that pillar nailed down first it's not the be all and end all like once you earn a certain amount threshold but um yeah you've got to you've got to tackle that first because otherwise all of the other pillars don't fall into place interesting question i found with that and i see it with myself and a lot of people once you go beyond a certain point of income it doesn't necessarily bring you more happiness have you found that yeah for sure i think it just gives you it's a weird subconscious relief of not having any pressure for instance i never check i haven't checked my bank account religiously like i don't know what comes out my bank account being honest whereas i remember maybe six years ago i was worried about like certain invoices getting paid so i could pay everything and affording certain things so having that freedom of like booking a random trip to the maldives or flying first class somewhere you don't have to look at like or feel the pinch as much and that gives you more freedom to then look after family, fly family members over to different places and look after them. So I think, um, yeah, once you earn, I think the studies have shown like once you earn past, I think $150,000 a year or pounds, the incremental differences in happiness uh, don't really change drastically as much for sure. I definitely think like if you're below that, then there definitely is a happiness gap that you can cross like until you get to that level. What was your biggest fear when you went out and did your own thing when you first left work for another company you want to go and start your own thing? Was there anything that yeah. like really sticks in your mind you're like afraid of at the time or anything that maybe held you back from doing mm. it? Or could you have yeah, done it sooner? Sure. Yeah, F first thing is not worrying what other people think. I was so obsessed with uh, what would ex-employees think and put myself out there on camera, video, start my own thing. People are going to laugh at me. Like, am I going to be a success? So there was a lot of fear. The fear of the unknown. Because like you are stepping into the unknown when you start a business because you don't have any experience in that. Like you can read books, you can watch YouTube, you can get mentors and they all help you. But until you actually put that foot forward and start the building process, nothing can prepare you for it. But fear holds a lot of people back. And I see that a lot when I mentor a lot of other business students inside my coaching program is most of the things you can tell them what to do and give them everything. But the, a lot of the things that hold people back are just fear. As you get more successful in life, you realize like fear is false expectation appearing real and uh, that's really stuck with me what would you say is the biggest fear specifically people like that throttles them back and holds them back I would definitely think fear of failure but also fear of it's the money thing like if if you haven't got because when you start a business you probably got no money or you're putting risk so you're risking uh, credit cards loans everything on the line to make it happen and uh, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything uh, is one of the things. So you've got to you've got to learn to risk that. And it's not for everyone. Like entrepreneurship is is certainly an avenue where I think it's a big buzzword. But a lot of people sometimes aren't prepared to do the inner work on themselves with mindset. And mindset, the thing is a wishy washy word. But there's a lot of layers to the mindset thing. And obviously, first things experience, but also working on the fact of like going into the unknown and the fear and breaking through those barriers. 
I think a lot of people get held back with that. It's interesting what you say in terms of fear of failure, because that's probably one of the biggest driving forces that motivates me is the fear of like going back. So like four years ago, I was an estate agent and like yeah. now I live in Dubai, do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. Like, like you said, my, my whole goal in life was to be able to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, which mm. I can now do. So like my big driving force is like, fuck that, I don't want to ever go back. Mm. That's what motivates me. What motivates you? What motivates me is always the image of me on my deathbed and living with regret. So they say like man's biggest regret is when they are on that deathbed, it's uh, did they leave everything on the table? Did they achieve everything they wanted in life? They look back and they could have done more. They should have, would have, could have. And I don't want to be that person. I want to know that I have been the best version of myself in every pillar in, in my life, trying to reach my full potential. I don't think anyone reaches their full capability potential, but as long as I can know that I can rest in peace knowing like I gave everything, I think that's very important. A lot of people talk about legacy. I was always attached to like, I want to create a legacy, but as we all know, like in two, three generations, no one will remember who I am, who you are. No one cares. So also you want to live life to the full and actually enjoy life as well. So I have a balance between, yes, create a legacy and multi-millions, but also enjoy the life whilst we got it because there's no there's no tomorrow that's promised i think that's a great way to think about it like you don't know who your grandparents grandparents were mm. so when you start to think back like that you think like okay the complete re your relevance in 150 years is irrelevant like no one's going to so care true. at all when you think like that then it makes you realize that i think it gives you a new sense of freedom almost yeah i was even thinking about this yesterday like about my grandpa because i named uh, my recruitment agency ronald james ronald is my grandpa i mean with the greatest respect he was a great man and but i don't really think about him much and none of my family talk about him much and we don't visit his grave or do you know what i mean so i'm thinking fuck that was only one generation ago so no one's really gonna even know what i've achieved um in my family name is is probably the most most generations in my family like i want to keep that name tradition on and and be the first generational wealth that I've created in my family uh, legacy. But I, I still won't be remembered in probably two or three generations. So I don't know if you're an Ed Milet fan, but I yeah, remember yeah. listening to like his motivational talk. He does this sick when he talks about like mm. this, the one, the one person who comes who like breaks the family like generation and yeah. like comes through and like changes everyone's lives forever. Do you feel you're that person? Yeah, I would say so. I've, I've looked back through my family legacy. I don't think anyone's been multimillionaire within my generations, like past two, three, four generations, I don't think so. Yeah, and I feel like it's a good pressure to have, like, cause I want to create a good life for even my parents, uh, retire my parents and look after my brothers and a sister and, and then future wife and kids and everything else. So um, that's probably a driving force as well. Cause again, you need money with all of those things. Yeah, I would definitely say like, when you, you're the first one to break through that generational wealth in the family, it's a, it's a, I like the pressure of doing that because it's a good like fulfillment to look after other family members. 100%. Now you, you refer to mindset earlier. As you've developed and like progressed through your business career and sort of financial career, have you found you've had to focus on different aspects in terms of your mindset and like almost keeping your head screwed on different points? It's like stresses and pressures and like everything just suddenly starts to change a lot when you've got a lot more, almost too many options in life. Yeah, there's a lot of distractions as you progress in life because it's easy just to enjoy the summer. Like Jim Rohn, a previous mentor of mine, he used to like put it into four seasons of life so obviously you've got your spring autumn winter summer and I was I went through a stage probably the last few months where I've like made the most money I've, I've ever made in my life and I can pretty much do anything I want and um, I was enjoying those summer moments so like holidays relaxing still working but probably not working to my full potential but because I built the systems the team the structure I was just enjoying those moments and then now it's like getting ready for autumn again and because uh, obviously, obviously I've reaped what I've sown and then now I want to build again to go to the next stage and I think it's good to sometimes settle down enjoy the next mountain as it were so you climb one mountain then there's another you want another to peak. You get up yeah um, so that's sort of where I'm at now. You seem to have, and I think I mentioned this before, you've got a very like, calm aura about you. Is that always yeah. something you've had or something that you've developed over time? Because a lot of entrepreneurs, I would say myself including that, can be very like too high octane and too yeah, yeah. like over the top sometimes. And they're like, I sometimes, I've started meditating now to try and like, good. Uh, like bring in my focus to not think about a billion different things at the same time. Mm. Like singularity of focus is like the thing I'm trying to imprint on my brain now to focus on one thing. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything to sort of focus on that for yourself for the last few years? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I, I started meditating like uh, eight years ago. It was very similar type of personality, just always doing it, doing it, doing it, just forward thinking, full of ideas, doing everything. And um, meditation definitely keeps you calm, grounded. I think over time I've learned to, sim always in my mind, it's simplifying things, whether it's business, 
So like I only started my second business like three years ago after my first business was successful for five years running, doing seven figures. Then I started my seven my second seven figure business and it was a lot easier. I got there a lot quicker because I'd learned from previous mistakes, uh, but also it's not getting caught up in just hyper growth all of the time because then you've got so much complexity, then you get more stress and then you get more on top of things. So it's like, I always want to make sure that the businesses uh, don't really affect me personally as much. And then I can turn on the pressure when I want to, when I want to go like hyper growth and go into something, then I can come back and be calm. So meditation definitely helps for sure. And I think it's just, like you said, focus on one thing. There's a good book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. I I just uh, was reading it again actually last week. But that always sticks in my mind is like trying to keep things simple in business is very important. Um, A lot of people get distracted. um, And I see that all the time where they invest in other businesses, start up a fifth, sixth, seventh business. Like instead of just focus on one or two core businesses, because as humans, it's impossible to focus on four or five different ideas and projects at the same time. Do you see that with a lot of, say, like I see that with some of the business coaching students I teach and other entrepreneurs, they try and have too many different programs, too many different offerings. Mm -hmm. And it's almost too complicated complicate from their point of view mm. and even the end consumer doesn't even know what to fucking buy like yeah. do you see that happen a lot yeah well they call it like you want to have uh one product one problem to solve like get to one million on like one thing first uh one funnel like one, one channel, offer yeah. one offer one channel alex or Mosey style yeah. that sticks with me as well because yeah you see people adding on too many different offers too many different products um again i'm always simplifying like even in our uh, online education company we have like three products but really it's like two because obviously we have the mastermind, but it's really, and then now I'm trying to put it just into two from the three, because again, for, to give customers a choice, you don't want to overcomplicate. I think the maximum is really want to give them three offerings, ideally two. Yeah, a lot of people create probably too many offerings at the start and that complicates things. Coming back to you and some of your routines and how you keep yourself so organized and, and calm, as even in like this podcast is coming across very like controlled, what would be, how do you structure your day in that aspect to keep things under control? And you mentioned as well that you, are quite limited with the amount you let yourself work to some degree like and that's all built upon systems and structure mm. you talk a little bit about that yeah sure so like my every day is i always start like with a journal i never check emails go on the laptop before realistically probably 11 12 it 11 a.m 12 p.m the morning ritual for me is get up i'll either go for a run go to the gym have a protein shake coffee and then i'll normally go to a coffee shop i'll have my journal go through my day plan what projects i need to work on brainstorm ideas and then um yeah, I'll probably start work at like 11, 12. And then it's probably sprint, so like a 90-minute sprint, rest, do some lunch, another 90 minutes, then maybe another 90 minutes. So like, I think the core focus time is important. So realistically, three lots of, yeah, three lots of chunks of 90 minutes. If I haven't got a mastermind Q&A or something on that day is, is normally how I best work. But I, I like floating around and having freedom, I think, just a lot now. Like, because one decision can make a big impact. So there might be two, three days where people might think I don't, actually do work as such apart from maybe catching up some with some of the team in slack but a lot of the time i'm thinking about recreating my offer what value i can bring whether it's a new ad campaign whatever i'm just doing a lot of the thinking stuff because that's when the best ideas come rather than tasks all of the time i don't really like sticking to them anymore but i had to do that to get to where i've got to so that's what a lot of people try and skip to the point of how can i uh, automate and delegate and systemize my business from day one and not be working in the business like I worked in the business for the th- first like three years or so at least and it did the extra 60 70 hours a week while systemizing a business whilst delegating because that's what it takes to be successful yeah at what point did you realize you could suddenly start to delegate and systemize sim- systematize things more and did you have any point struggle to give things off because like one of my favorite sayings mm. is like you can either have like growth or you can have control you can't like do everything yourself yeah, and let the business grow within itself yeah very true just learning from lots of mentors at the start so reading a lot of books youtube podcasts attending different seminars and then understanding i understood automation so like linkedin automation email automation then it was like i'm sourcing to virtual assistants back in the day years ago when um four hour work week was a thing yeah. with tim ferris all of those things fr- was a framework of like how i could do things slightly differently and then it was systemizing the business with the e-myth by michael kerber i got to meet him a couple of times so that that was a systems mindset of like any repeatable process inside the business can we get a standardized sop can we do video tutorial step by step outsource it to either a va or someone in the team and delegate um which is important but again control yeah so probably the first two or three years i controlled a lot and then over time i've delegated everything to my recruitment agency side i don't do anything in that business and it still does 
does very well. Even though I know if I went back in that business and spent time in the office for two weeks, I would probably go nuts. Why are we doing it this way? Why are we not doing that? Why are we not doing that? The more hands off you are, just you've got a, once you've got a team of A players, you can trust them. They might not do it the way you want to do it. And if you were in the business, it might perform a little bit better. But then I couldn't focus on my other businesses as well. And it's probably not a high leverage task. Uh, so it's all about like making sure that you focus on high leverage tasks and the low value tasks. You, you always want to try and outsource and delegate as soon as possible. Would you say one of the keys to your success, I find myself doing this sometimes, like you mentioned there, like you go into office, like if I go into Slack or I start looking at things, like for fuck's sake, why has this been done yeah. like this? And I start like overly micromanaging things. Is that something mm -hmm. you try and keep yourself back from to try and focus on the overall rather than too many specifics sometimes? Yeah, but I think I'll end up getting down a rabbit hole as soon as I dive into something like that. And then I'll either just fix it there and then, like say if we've got an outreach campaign using LinkedIn for organic outreach and the messaging isn't right or we're not getting good reply rates so or we haven't set things up right, I would rather just go in, do a Google Doc, do step by step and then boom, that's the training, that's it done. But as humans, what you tend to find with employees as well is they don't follow process anyway. So I spent a lot of the time, probably year two, year three, literally trying to systemize everything in the business and you just realize people humans just don't follow it like they're never going to be entrepreneurial like you so and they're never going to do it as good as you so you've got to be prepared that if you're going to do it nine ten out of ten they're probably going to do it six or seven out of ten so you've got to make sure that there's there's things underpinning that that's going to at least get them to that standard otherwise you'll be working tirelessly all the time trying to get them up to eight out of ten nine out of ten and i think just like if you're lower the expectations a little bit around when you do delegate it's never going to be done as good as you no matter how much you shout and scream and build step-by-step -step processes like things are naturally always going to break to a certain point now you work in recruitment so it's an interesting question what's your approach to recruitment and building your team so i think as in sales people buy from people so when i hire employees they they're buying from me as such like they're investing in me so the more passionate i am about the journey the vision the project the easier it is to hire people so i've noticed this when i mentor a lot of my recruitment owners inside one of my coaching programs they struggle with the hiring piece that's because i don't think they come some sometimes they don't come across very passionate they've got to be very you've got to be likable and enthusiastic around your vision and why they're going to work for you and they can see your future instead of just doing a nice job ad and everything else it's like they need to have conviction to know that why they should work for you over 20 30 other people so i think that that's exactly the same mindset as i had when people used to say to me how do i find mentors like i was very lucky for my journey i had lots of mentors for free that were some were worth 100 million some were worth 60 70 million that I was playing golf with i met them because i was always hungry for personal development and learning things all of the time and i could add value to, to them in their business so that's probably the same when you're hiring employees like you've got to add value to them and know that you're doing something a little bit of a different way compared to the competition that intrigues them and keeps them on board tip when i look for hiring is i always say in my interview look i'm not going to be a man manager i'm not going to be here to motivate you every day and wind you up like to go away and work so you need to come to work batteries included like i'm not here to charge you up and get you motivated for the day you need to self-motivate yourself and want to do the work so i always set expectations from the start when we do hire is like they need to come to work ready because sometimes as an entrepreneur, you're not going to be able to be the micromanager all of the time and keep those people motivated. And I always try and get my employees to read, watch YouTube videos, do motivational things, because you always want to create that spark with them. But some people just want a nine to five job as well and a repeatable task. So it does depend on what type of employee you're hiring. But definitely for A players, you need to do all of the, the things I mentioned and more to get them on board. Do you share like YouTube videos and books and stuff with your teams, try and get them to read them, try and pump them up a bit then? Yeah, all the time. And uh, we used to do that in the office and we used to do like a lunch and learn and then I'd play like a, a motivational YouTube video or a mentor that I learned from 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then always in Slack channels, like I'll always try and get them to watch. What you'll tend to notice, they probably won't be as hungry as we are to learn all the time. I'm sure you're the same, like on an evening, I'll spend two, three hours a night watching some YouTube. And it's interesting because you'll tend to see like what, oh, well, what, differentiate the success between yourself or me or someone else is like doing that little bit more all of the time like we probably don't need to do that little bit more but we do anyway and that's why we're constantly getting ahead and it's compound interest over time whereas other people will probably just be spending it going out getting pissed or watching like reality shows or whatever it is like it's the successful people are always doing that little bit more and those little incremental things to try and learn and try and improve all of the time you've got to be curious about knowledge 
and always wanting to learn. It's interesting, it just reminded me of a friend of mine came to stay with me a couple of weeks ago and he was on the sofa watching something on Netflix and I was sitting there like watching sales videos whilst eating my yeah. breakfast. And he's like, he looked over me and he's like, that's why you're successful, I'm not. I'm like, mm-hmm. like but that, it wasn't, I wasn't doing it intentionally. It was like unconsciously, that's what I wanted to do yeah, because I'm passionate about the game of learning and like, I'm a big believer in like, life is a game of skill acquisition and the more mm-hmm. skills you have, like the further you'll go with mm-hmm. even less effort. You mentioned in terms of uh, mentors, who's had the biggest impact on you originally and maybe recently? The ones that stick in my head probably from my younger days were the likes of Grant Cardone, Ty Lopez. I still think he's killing the game. I've got now. big into his YouTube like last week. I don't know why I've never listened to any of it before. But it's Ty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought, that was probably one of the first programs I bought was 67 Steps back eight years ago when he was his Lamborghini in the garage with all the books in the background. That went like viral back in the day. And that got me into reading. So I was reading a book a week consistently. So I went through all of the books that Ty recommended and then Amazon on speed all the time, Amazon Prime buying book after book. So I would say Ty Lopez, Grand Cardone, like which are more well-known probably brands that people could start with. Uh, Jim Rohn is a great mentor. He's not alive anymore, but he was Tony Robbins' mentor back in the day. So probably those three. Now I would say Alex Amorzi is great. I'm sure a lot of your audience uh, watch him. Some some great value in those uh his book and obviously his YouTube. So I would say those, and then now it would just be for specific things. So whether it's sales, maybe someone like Cole Gordon, I've done his course recently on sales. Who else would we do? A spirituality mindset. So spirituality and mindset would be Naval Ravikant. I mentioned his book, The Alchemy. I think it's called The Alchemy something. That's very good, simple. He's created multi-millions with his SaaS companies, but he always has the pillars of like happiness with health, wealth, love, happiness. So yeah, I like to vary it up. And then spirituality would be someone like um, Sadhguru or also those type of guys. And then finance, Ray Dalio's books are really cool and good. So yeah, there's there's quite a few. I've probably missed quite a few off, but I mean, they're endless. But just learning from people at the top, are they where you want to be? Or have they been successful in their own right or in whatever sector or avenue that you're looking at to get mentors? Because there's a lot of people that are given a lot of advice now, but it's like, what have they done to get to where they've got to? Yeah. I think there's a lot of people, like fake gurus on the internet who their mm. business is giving advice rather than actually having a business in the first place, mm. which I think is very frustrating. Yeah, for sure. And that's getting more and more because people want more reach and content. So everyone's creating reels, everyone's creating TikToks, etc. Whereas like some of the real business gurus, you can go on YouTube and watch and it's maybe only had a few thousand views, but this guy's probably cre- like maybe created a billion dollar company and it's an interview. And those are the ones that I like to try and find as opposed to the ones that are just big title thumbnail clickbait clickbait well edited just more netflix like keeping you enthralled for the viewer I, i'd rather learn from someone that's like made multi-millions or billions and sometimes those don't get the bigger clicks but it's you want to try and find through them what's been your biggest challenge in business i would say biggest challenge has probably been definitely hiring hiring's probably the biggest challenge for most businesses if you really want to grow if you want to move away from solopreneur business or small boutique business under eight to ten employees is definitely having the art and skill of hiring good A players that's and retaining them in most businesses that's really the bottleneck of when you analyze most companies if they could hire 10 A players tomorrow they would and they would grow by 10x so I think definitely hiring has probably been one of the challenges I think early on is always managing cash flow because cash is king without money to pay the wages at the end of the month then you don't have a business so managing cash flow at the start is making sure that it's a fine art and balance between your expenses and being on the pulse with the finance aspect. A lot of people aren't. So I was always religious at the start, checking bank accounts every day, being on top of invoices. I managed that full FD CFO style role because I thought it was very important because it was drilled into me from a guy called James Kahn. He used to be on Dragon's Den. He was in recruit. He's in recruitment as well. And when I met him a few times, because he wanted to invest in me in the early stages. And he mentioned the number one thing was, was cash is king. And just always remember that. Always keep on the pulse with the cash flow because you could have good revenue but if the cash isn't actually coming in the bank in the business bank and can cover your expenses you can be liquidated overnight so yeah that was one of the things that i took away early on it's a relevant point coming to obviously talking about what's going on globally in terms of like recession and like particularly if you watch british media and what they do like the world's mm-hmm. coming to an end mm-hmm. what would be your advice for like business owners and maybe people who work as employees in a situation in terms of ways to maybe make money during this or survive during this sort of recession mm. 
I would definitely say still like there's never been a better time to start a business. Like even when I started a business eight years ago, it was a lot harder then than it is now, especially with online. There's loads of different jobs and freelance jobs you could start off with, whether it's been a video editor to like a consultancy to marketing consultancy to an agency. There's a lot of businesses you could start. You need to take it back into control. So a lot of people that are working nine to five jobs, you are at risk of being probably sucked into the social credit score system and into the current system that they want to suck you into into this new world order as it were so like i think a lot of even if you're not an entrepreneur you need to be looking after your family and bringing it into your control because it could be a lot of layoffs it could be you could be suddenly redundant so upgrading your skill set so you might it might not be starting a business today but it might be reading a book a week or watching youtube about a certain skill set and being very good at that because the standard jobs will probably go in terms of that are quite repeatable and can be on source or can be cut. So like if you're in a position where you're in a nine to five job, you need to get a good skill. That's the number one thing. And then also I would still say even in this recession, a lot of like the best businesses, the most successful people were in a downturn because there's a lot of opportunity, but it's making sure you turn off the media. You don't get sucked into the drama. You don't surround yourself with all the family members because a lot of them can be negative and it's no disrespect to them. They're just, they just won't be in the same mindset as you. Surround yourself. You are the average of the five people you hang around with most. So making sure you're around other like-minded individuals that can help propel you. So doing all of those daily habits is going to help. Maybe even creating a second source of income if you have just got a standard job. Like that's a must now. You can't just be going nine to five work and just do nothing else because you're at risk for sure. Makes complete sense. One of the things you mentioned there in terms of like cutting people off is almost one of the things I think I've done the last few years almost like just blinkering myself off mm. from everyone. Is that something you it's found good. been a pivotal thing in some respects to your success? And almost like mm. now I find if I spend time with people who I used to be friends with five years ago, not that it irritates me, but it does a little bit to some respects because they don't think the way I think and yeah. the way they behave sometimes isn't the way I want to conduct myself. That's good but I, I was probably similar to you in terms of the people I hang around with now and who I would say are my core best friends. A lot of them I actually met in Dubai the last two years. Uh, one of my best friends, he's worth like I think 30 million and he's Young, much younger than me very successful and I enjoy spend, we enjoy spending time with each other and we motivate each other and we've got the same interests the same tastes the same beliefs the same outlook on the world so I think the more you surround yourself with those people I think I would say my friendship group in Dubai is easily like probably 15-20 people I could hang around with go for lunch coffees and they're not wasted time like say if we went for coffee we'll learn from each other add value and we all want each other to be successful which is a big difference between maybe old friendship groups there might be a slight tinge of jealousy just not naturally as humans because they can't get to where you've got to and they see you back as your old self who you were five ten years ago and they're like oh charlie you've changed or james you've changed well yeah i have but you haven't so that's your problem people need to evolve as humans and change and I think there's all that stigma of like, oh, you've changed as if that's a bad thing. No, that's a good thing. It's a bad thing if you stayed where you are and you're still the same person living in the same house, working in the same job as you did five, 10 years ago. Because like, that's not what life's about. It's a growth centric experience. You always want to be growing and evolving. 100% agree with that. I think for men, the most important thing is progression in life and then progression mm -hmm. is what's going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you said that, like people have literally said that to me before, like Charlie, you've changed. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm like, fucking good. Yeah, I have changed, yeah. but you haven't changed. So I'm yeah. leaving you behind. Like you need mm -hmm. to keep up or you're going to get left behind. And I think that's mm -hmm. where people need to have that growth mindset and if they're not willing to push themselves and progress and become better then almost what's the point like i'm like with everything like i'm all in or i'm all out there's like mm -hmm. you either do it or you don't i agree yeah it's it, and it's obviously you can see the passion from yourself like it is frustrating but you can't sometimes other humans just don't change and i've learned that over time i used to spend a lot of energy trying to change people or sending them a youtube video to watch or read this book or do this do that and nine times out of ten they're probably not going to do it so you can you can try your best especially for close friends and family but at some point you've got to cut them off and it doesn't need to be it's just the case you might not message them back straight away you and that's another thing like as you get more successful your time is so precious and it's sometimes it might come across ignorant but like I'm very I'm, I need to improve on this but I don't respond to people all of the time straight away because my mindset is in a different area and I need to focus on business so I'm not always responding to friends or people all of the time on whatsapp or whatever because it needs to be on my terms and my time because my time is more precious because if I invest that time in my business I can make 10x more money or improve my life so i think it's been selective around that people will think they use that as the negative part of how i've changed maybe oh well you don't ring me anymore you don't text back or whatever it's just because my, my life is just totally different now and i think especially when you're in an environment in dubai time goes by so fast and you're just constantly like growing so it's like you haven't got time for maybe people back in the uk as much as you you would like to or you have in the past so but you have got to be with us and a lot of people don't do that people don't want to evolve the peer group i always 
always evolved my peer group. When I look back over the last 10, 12 years, I was constantly upgrading my peer group all of the time, hanging around with older people, more successful people. Uh, and then now I've got younger people that are more successful. So like, but just having the right people around me that we could both add value. Because if not, then what's the point? Oh, you went to school with someone. So what? The school system's another joke anyway. So you shouldn't have even been at school anyway, being around those type, like certain people. So a lot of people have that affinity with uh, friendships because of being going for 15, 20 years. But I've got strong friendships with people I've had for two years. That I know like I could trust them with a million dollars tomorrow for example. And some people in the past, you probably couldn't because they're not at that level where they could pay the money back for starters. Yeah. Like if you've got someone else that's worth 30, 40 million, when you can lend them that money or you can trust them with certain things because they can get you out of trouble, like you can get them out of trouble. Would you say moving to Dubai has changed your mindset? Yeah, 100%. Like my mindset was always you change, but it's a lot harder. Let's be honest. Like say at the time recording this, like it's winter back in the UK, dark, miserable, raining. Imagine trying to go. I mean, you would still go to the gym every day. I, but mate, I was I in like Romania Google yesterday. Up. It like it's depressing. Like <laughs> yeah. grey, cold. Like yeah, it's hard to get motivated. Like I remember, I still remember the times when I was. Uh, I moved into my first house when I was just about to start my recruitment agency. I was working in a recruitment agency like eight till eight, Wolf of Wall Street style. And I put a gym in the garage and it's freezing cold, pitch black with the garage open, trying to do some cold weights. I was thinking like, it's so hard, but I was doing it whilst listening to an audiobook of Grand Cardone, the 10X. I still remember that time. I was like, but that's what it took to like, I was doing that whilst I was still working 12 hour days before I even started my business. Yes, it was anxious. Yes, I was a bit stressed. Yes, there was a lot of pressure, but I did it anyway. And I think it's a lot easier. Yes, in Dubai, you wake up guaranteed sun every day. It's shining, it's positive, it's happy. There's a lot of wealth around you, a lot of success. Uh, there's a big choice of different gyms you can go to every day to mix it up. There's just so much choice. Everything's 20 minutes drive. Everything's 20 minutes delivered to your door. There's so much convenience it's so hard going back like even going back to the UK I'm, I'll go back for Christmas for a week to see family and some friends but probably that's that's enough do you know what I mean like because you've accustomed like you've accustomed to this comfort zone here in Dubai like they've built they've built it really well for successful people for sure and it it just it's definitely 10x like the, not just the way I think but my productivity as well I think I've made a lot more money being in Dubai not just from tax savings and everything else but just just the environment I would say the people the weather, the the facilities, everything. Like, it is it is great. One last question for you, James, to wrap up. What would be the one piece of advice you'd give your 18-year-old self? So I would say uh, just don't worry about what other people think and just do it anyway. So <laughs> even if you're in down, just do it. You'll learn from your mistakes. Just keep driving forward. And yeah, and just don't give a fuck what other people think awesome appreciate that thank you very much for your time james where for anyone to find out some more information about you check you out yeah you can check me out on instagram at james blackwell or james blackwell on youtube i do a lot of youtube content as well awesome so make sure we'll check james out if you enjoyed and love the podcast make sure you subscribe on youtube drop a comment below and leave us five star review on itunes if you that there and we'll see you in the next episode